Out of the shadows, a monster emerges. A creature from the depths of your darkest nightmare. And there is little comfort in the bright light of day. For even then, it lurks in the quiet, shaded woodline. And the solitude of regions where few men dare to tread. I'm Dr. William Lester. And I welcome you to Dogman Terror Anthology 3. My name is Terry, and I have a short but scary story about my run-in with a dogman. I live in a certain part of Florida that has very deep woods and it's a very swampy location. I don't want to be too specific about the names of places. In fact, I've even changed some of the names for the purposes of this story because I've learned all too well what can happen when people find out about a dogman encounter. Now, I've had multiple strange occurrences around my property, mostly at night. But I want to tell you about this one particular incident that, to put it mildly, scared the hell out of me. Now, what happened took place in an area called Gibson Creek Campground. I was invited to go hunting with a buddy of mine last winter for wild hogs. You could usually find them out there looking for water or rutting around in the muck. So we left out from Gibson Creek Campground and paddled upstream. Eventually, we made it way out to where we could make another camp. After nightfall, we'd already set out a couple of trail cameras. I'd say we were there till about 2 a.m. And the forest, which is usually quite noisy, was somehow strangely silent. You know that kind of quiet that you know isn't right? So I turned to my buddy and he turned to me. We gave each other those looks of a little fear and a little confusion. So we humped it back to the tent. I'd say no more than 60 seconds later, we heard what sounded like something huge booking it across the creek over on our side about 10 feet out, and then it just stopped. When we looked out, oh my God, what we saw was a gigantic wolf, maybe eight feet tall, standing there on the other side of the creek. I heard a deep, low-level growl and my friend perked up to silently announce that he heard it too. So of course, you can imagine that seeing that creature, realizing that something like that is real, scared the complete and total shit out of both of us. We didn't hear it anymore, and after that, the regular nighttime forest sounds came back. Crickets, owls, all of the things you'd expect. But we didn't leave our tent until daylight. So please, allow me to offer this little advice. If you enjoy camping, that's fine. If you enjoy a jaunt through the woods, great. But when the sun starts to go down, get your ass out of the forest and back to the main camping area and stay there until sunrise. Up a cremo, a mellow mild cremo, a winning smoke by far. You can search every climb, but at three for a dime, you can't beat a cremo cigar. Sweet-scented Cigar Smoking Society. This is Arthur Godfrey down in Washington, D.C. Mike Man Godfrey, Cremo's capricious custodian of the calorific cantata. (laughs) 
I'm an avid bird watcher. I took up the hobby about three years ago and it's really been one of the most enjoying, fulfilling experiences of my life. I remember when I was little, my grandmother had several bird feeders and baths in her backyard and I would sit at the window and watch all the different birds fly in and out. Robins, brown thrashers, cardinals, blue jays, as well as many more that I couldn't identify at the time. But it was my love of bird watching, or some people are now calling it birding, that led to an experience that I would never, ever forget. It was about this time last year on an unusually warm January day when I trekked up to Dawson Forest Wildlife Management Area. Dawsonville is north of Atlanta in Dawson County. The location is a large area of varied habitat near the Etowah River. I knew that the marshy wetlands hosted breeding species including common yellowthroat, indigo bunting, blue grosbeak, orchard oriole, so on and so forth. Plus, I was counting on seeing what species could be seen along the edges of the forest. There was a nice blind with a bench overlooking the pond where I could look for waterfowl and waders. So that's exactly where I headed once I got there. I hit the bench, took out my thermos of piping hot coffee, poured a cup, took a few sips, and just kind of took in the surroundings. The morning mist had all but dissipated. I broke out my Athlon Argos binoculars, looked out across the pond, and got the shock of my life. Standing on the far bank of the pond was some kind of large canine type creature. It reminded me of something in many of the werewolf movies over the last several years. Its ears pointed straight up. It was very tall and had broad, powerful looking shoulders. Through my binoculars, I could make out its muscle definition and its eyes had a very deep orange tint to them. The other really strange thing about it was that it seemed to have hands with fingers instead of paws. I was in an absolute vortex of abject fear and wild fascination. Now the creature looked around and then went down on all fours and started drinking, but stopped after only a few seconds. It raised up its nose and I could see its nostrils flaring. Then came a moment of total terror. It must have caught my scent because it locked its eyes dead on me and I didn't move. But while I kept my binoculars on the creature, my brain was on fire trying to calculate how fast I could get back to the car. Then, as it kept those enormous fiery eyes fixed on me, the creature let out a roar that hit me like a tornado. From that point on, I was in survival instinct mode and I'm sure that I moved faster that day than I ever had in my life. Shit, I'm not even sure that my feet were touching the ground, and before I knew it, I was slamming the car door shut and starting the engine. I don't even think I exhaled until I hit the on-ramp to the interstate. So that's what happened. I have read a good bit on cryptozoology since then. All kinds of encounters with all kinds of creatures. Chupacabra, Mothman, Bigfoot, Lake Monsters and a menagerie of other weird things. And of all things, my first and so far only cryptid experience had to be with a damn dog man. Maybe the very worst of all. to Madison and on both sides of Park. They ask for Rheingold Extra Dry before and after dark. From Coney to Connecticut on Bradford Avenue. From 
Jersey scenes way up to Queens, they sing as millions do. Rye beer and rye, golden rye beer. Friendly, fresh, sing and happily dry beer. Dry me clean and it's clear. Dry me thirst, quenching beer. Join the millions to buy rye gold beer. Extra dry. I've been hunting for over 30 years now. My father, grandfather, great uncle, and cousins all taught me the meaning of the ways of the hunter. And not just that, I learned what it meant to be an outdoorsman, to have an understanding and appreciation and respect for nature. But none of that experience, none of that understanding or appreciation could have prepared me for an encounter with a dog man. All of it came about one morning with me and my father scouting out a new hunting area. Since we were totally unfamiliar with the area, we thought it prudent to not go unarmed. About 20 minutes in, we found a trail that needed checking out. As soon as we hit it, I caught a flash of movement off to the left side of the trail, about 25 to 30 yards away. I didn't think much of it at first because it's normal, for example, to see the movement of birds flitting back and forth on branches and into the brush and brambles of a thicket. But both my dad and I stopped cold in our tracks when the sound of a low rumbling growl reached our ears. But it was more than that. You could feel the power of the growl vibrating all the way through you down to the bone. Now, I said quietly that we must have walked up on a bear with a cub and the growl was intended to scare us off. But my father just shook his head and said, we have a situation here. Then the shit got real. From the left side of the trail, out of the brush, stepped a gigantic wolf-like creature that was standing on two legs. The head was easily three times bigger than a large German Shepherd. It had black fur and dirty yellow eyes. And this thing had a muscle mass like you wouldn't fucking believe. It was easily seven feet tall and had a mouthful of teeth that looked ready to do business. So there we were, my father and I, caught up in a terrifying showdown with this thing. I raised my pistol and pointed it at the creature, and when I did, it tilted its head to the right. Then my dad said under his breath, put that goddamn thing down and take two steps back. Then the creature dropped down on all four legs and took off to the right at a tremendous speed and we watched it until it disappeared into the forest. That was about 10 years ago. My father and I have talked about it several times, only with each other, off and on since then. He always reminds me that if I'd pulled the trigger that day, that I probably wouldn't be around today to share this story with you. From San Francisco comes Right a Roni, the San Francisco treat. Right a Roni, the flavor can't be beat. One pan of boiling cooking ease, the flavor that is sure to please. Right a Roni, the San Francisco treat. Rice a the delicious break from potatoes, now in six fabulous flavors. One pan of boiling cooking ease, the flavor that is sure to please. Right, Maroni, the San Francisco treat. I love fishing for bluegill, or brim as most Georgia folks call them. Now, brim are also commonly known as panfish which just refers to an edible game fish that doesn't grow larger than the size of a typical frying pan. And you catch them with just about anything you can put on a hook. Breadcrumbs, cheese, bits of hot dog, anything. But for the record, the best bait for brim include worms, crickets, grasshoppers, or even small bits of shrimp. 
One funny thing about them though, they can be somewhat aggressive and don't seem to have any fear of humans, but if you enjoy catching them as much as I do, that's a good thing. Anyway, a few years ago, I bought one of those pond prowlers at Bass Pro Shop. It's a one-man fishing boat, eight feet long, and perfect for the kind of fishing that I like to do. But this isn't just a story about me telling you how I went fishing one day. It all leads into something that still gives me nightmares. I just thought that maybe sharing it would be cathartic. Some people will believe it, some won't. I don't really give a shit about that part of it. I just want to gain some degree of, I don't know, peace of mind. Anyway, I was out on the boat one Saturday at one of the local ponds. Now that particular area has a number of small to medium sized ponds that are fantastic for brim fishing. I remember the day was mostly sunny with a few clouds that drifted across the sky from time to time, providing brief moments of shade from the late spring sunlight. Now, after about 20 minutes of fishing, I noticed some kind of movement in a dense thicket of reeds by the bank at the far side of the pond, maybe 30 to 40 yards away. Then I heard the sound of something thrashing the water, but whatever was making the noise was obscured by the reeds. And then it wasn't. Rising up from the reeds was a huge creature that had all the features of a wolf except that it was standing up on two legs. I was frozen in place with terror. Now this thing had dark fur, very dark fur, and eyes that seemed yellowish orange, and they were locked on me. There was what I took to be blood around the snout of the creature, and there was also what looked to be some kind of dead animal in its right hand. I remember saying under my breath, holy shit over and over. I started maneuvering my boat back to the bank while also trying to keep an eye on the wolf thing. When I got myself back on the dry land and secured the boat in the cab of my truck, the creature was still there watching me. As I walked around to get into the truck, the creature let out a loud growling snarl as if to hasten my departure, and it damn sure worked. As I pulled away, I saw the wolf creature lower down onto four legs and then run off in the opposite direction. Man, I tell you, I've never been so goddamn scared in my life. It just goes to show you what kind of trouble you can get in when you interrupt dog man's dinner. Said the captain to the bosun, so look for the package with the ship that sails the ocean. Yo ho, yo ho. That's the sound that I hear almost nightly for weeks at a time, beginning in September, or more precisely, immediately after the advent of the fall equinox. 
I live about an hour and a half's drive north of a major city in the southeastern United States. In this particular area, you can find sizable stretches of woodlands, creeks, and even some relatively dense forests. This is the habitat of those things out there. Those creatures howling into the darkness of the autumn night sky. This past autumn, the fall of 2020, was no different. I heard the howls in the distance and listened as they seemed to come closer. This seemed to be their nightly routine, to emerge from the inner depths of the forest and prowl along its outer perimeter. I know because it got to the point where I could go out in my deck, which overlooks a woodline, and I could actually watch them step out of the woodland cover. There would typically be four or five of them, never less than three, at least of what I could see. On nights with good moonlight, I could see them even better. They would move through the trees, going from four legs to two, and then back again seemingly arbitrarily. When they did go bipedal, I got a true sense of their size and features. But it was always the eyes. Now, one could easily be struck by the seven or eight foot height, the clawed fingered hands, the impressive musculature, or even the surreal nature of their movement. But for me, it was the eyes, those massive, amber, nightmarish hell portals through which somehow these creatures measured their reality. There were even rare occasions when one of them would turn those eyes in my direction, looking directly at me, as if to let me know that they were aware of my presence, and then turned its gaze away dismissively and walked on. Their eyes terrified me. So yes, these things are out there, hunting, lurking, hiding, stalking. And I know that come September next, there will once again be howls in the forest. You're listening to the Blackwater Media Radio Network, the finest in digital audio entertainment. This is Blackwater Media coming to you from the great city of Atlanta. I want to start off by saying that, yes, I have heard of the creatures that appear to be upright walking wolves called dogmen. As far-fetched as some people think it is that these things exist, I tended to believe that they could actually be real, but never really imagined that I would ever see one. So let me tell you about something that happened on Christmas Eve five years ago. My wife and I live in Atlanta, but we own some property in South Georgia. We even have a little place down there that we use as a kind of retreat from the city once or twice a year. Now let me explain something to you. Our property in general and the house in particular sit right up against the Dixon Memorial State Forest, which is 35,000 acres of serious, deep woodland. In turn, the forest is positioned on the northwest side of the Okefenokee National Wildlife Refuge. In other words, I'm talking about the very definition of the word wilderness. Anyway, A week or so after Thanksgiving, my wife and I got it into our heads that it might be fun to spend Christmas at our place down in South Georgia. We both liked the idea of getting away from the rush and tumult of the city for a little while. It would also be a little warmer down there, but not so much that we couldn't enjoy a nice fire during the evening hours. So aside from enjoying the scenery, we arrived at the house after an uneventful four-hour drive. We got there about a half hour before sundown. I got the cooler out of the car and into the kitchen. My wife started preparing a couple of steaks for dinner while I got everything else unpacked and sorted. 
After that, I got a fire going, made a whiskey highball, turned the TV to ESPN, and started watching football. Everything was ready by 7, and as we sat down to eat, we both agreed to start working on the Christmas tree afterward. After about five minutes into the meal, we heard a sound that froze us both dead in place. It was a deep, terrifying howl that seemed to reverberate and come at us from every direction. I remember the expression on my wife's face and her eyes were as wide as I'd ever seen them. Mine must have been too. And she asked me point blank, what the fuck was that? So of course my brain started processing all of the possibilities because I knew that there was plenty of wildlife out there in that insane stretch of woods, including coyotes. I knew that what we just heard wasn't a goddamn coyote. The next thing we heard was the distinct sound of something moving around outside. Now by outside, I mean just outside of the house, something very close by. Now there were two windows that you could look out and see the front part of the property and two that would allow you to see the back, including the wood line. So we went to the front windows to look out, really hoping to see nothing. Instead, we saw something right out of a damn nightmare. About 10 yards away was what looked like an incredibly large wolf. And I mean like the size of a horse. It looked incredibly powerful and its head was tilted up slightly as if it were trying to catch a scent in the air. My wife stood there gaping, not saying a word, and I thought she might be in a mild state of shock. And if all this wasn't enough, this goddamn thing reared up and stood on its hind legs. You heard what I said, right? We're standing there, looking out the window, and this monster wolf, eight to nine feet tall, black fur, and a mouthful of big ass teeth. But it was the eyes on this thing. Those eyes were enormous and burned yellowish orange and there was an absolute look of stone hard malevolence in them. We kept watching, almost afraid to take our eyes off of it. It started to walk in a direction that would take it around the side of the house towards the back. We quickly moved to one of the back windows, the one in the kitchen. We got there just in time to see the creature drop down onto all four legs and dash to the wood line and into the darkness of the forest. This thing was so big and so fast, we could actually hear the sound of the impact it made as it crashed into the thicket. A few seconds later, we heard the howl again, and this time there was no mystery about what it was. We talked about it all through dinner and kept on talking about it while decorating the tree and sipping on larger than usual after dinner cocktails. These creatures were real, and we talked about how many other things out there probably existed too. Creatures like Bigfoot or Chupacabra, and even the Loch Ness Monster or Mothman. I mean, shit, why not? If dogmen are real, then everything else is on the table. One thing is for sure, that was one Christmas that we will never, ever forget.
If you're enjoying the show, go on over to blackwatermedia.net and join the Swamp Hunter Society. Just click on the Become a Member tab on the menu, and for only $4.99 a month, you can have exclusive access to the finest paranormal, horror, and supernatural story narration content available anywhere. It's the ultimate digital audio exploration into mystery, magic, monsters, and myth. Become a Blackwater Media Swamp Hunter Society member today. I'm an outdoorsman. I'm very experienced in hunting, camping, hiking, and general survival. I'm very familiar and used to wildlife, and I was charged by what I believe was the cryptid known as Dogman. It charged me and my cousin. It was not a bear. A bear can't move how it did. And it was not a normal wolf as they can't comfortably run on two legs, whereas the thing that charged us seemed natural in that form of locomotion. Now, this happened around June or July of 2007. I was around 17 years old and much more cocky back then, but still somewhat knowledgeable of the outdoors. My family used to own a cabin in northwest Wisconsin, so I basically grew up there in the summer, and I knew the woods well, but at night it was wise to stay in the cabin or at least by the bonfire by the beach because of bears, wolves, and cougars. One of the creepiest things was if you were having a bonfire, the tree line was visible from the fire pit and beach. And at night, you always felt like you were being watched from that tree line. But during the day, the woods always seemed normal, not so creepy. That is, until this incident. So, this happened during the middle of the day. Me and my cousin were having an airsoft battle, and I was in full woodland camo, and he wasn't. I retreated onto the ATV trail into the woods for a tactical advantage, and our battle took us about 200 meters into about a third of the way up the trail. We had enough at this point, and we were standing at the edge of a clearing on the trail talking, and he was maybe 10 feet from me when I decided to mess with him. I said, shh were being watched. He froze. Then I realized the woods were dead quiet and I got spooked and started scanning the tree line and the other edge of the clearing from left to right when I saw it. Its teeth gave it away. It was panting and staring at my cousin. Now I know that this may be hard to believe but fuck it. What I saw was a wolf as big as a black bear at least 300 or 400 pounds. But it wasn't normal. This wolf was on two legs, crouching next to the tree with his arm grasping the tree, grasping with a clawed hand, and it had reddish brown fur. I told my cousin, we have to go. And next thing I know, he's sprinting. And I look back at this creature who had locked on and sprinted a few steps on two feet, and then I turned and ran when it looked like it was dropping down to all fours. It charged us and sounded like it was right on our asses barreling through the brush. But for whatever reason, it let us go when we broke out of the tree line and headed for the cabin. What stuck with me the most was the sheer size of this damn thing. The creature appeared to be nearly seven feet tall when upright. And that's where it should have had front paws, but it appeared to have large clawed hands. Now, I'm not sure how to explain it away rationally, 
I have heard that wolves will occasionally kind of walk upright, but as far as I know, they can't sprint on two legs, nor do wolves get that big. And black bears more or less waddle on two legs for short periods of time. But now I do understand where the term dog man came from. And I can tell you for damn sure, it's something that I never want to see again. Mr. Clean gets rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Floors, doors, walls, halls, white sidewall tires and old golf balls. Sink, stoves, bathtubs, he'll do. He'll even help clean laundry too. Mr. Clean gets rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Can he clean a kitchen sink? Quicker than a wink. Can he clean a window sash? Faster than a flash. Can he clean a dirty mirror? He'll make it bright and clearer. Can he clean a diamond ring? Mr. Clean cleans anything. Mr. Clean gets rid of dirt and grime and grease in just a minute. Mr. Clean will clean your whole house and everything that's in it. Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean. This is my first time going public about my Dogman encounter, mostly out of fear of seeing it again. This took place roughly 14 years ago. When I was a kid, my family moved out of the city and moved to a small town called Deer Brook, situated on the outskirts of Antigua, Wisconsin. Our house was surrounded by woods on three sides and a river and field in the back. The first year out there was really calm and relaxing other than constant coyote howls every night. But every so often there would be a different howl. It was a deeper, much louder howl that would shake us to our core. At first, my parents would dismiss it as a wolf or just a bigger coyote, but something about it seemed off. One night in mid-July, my brother, my sister and I decided to pitch a tent in the back field along the tree line. We just wanted to go camping. We sat with sticks, roasting our marshmallows by the fire till it got really dark. And then the typical howl started up. But once again, that deep howl was back and it sounded like it was right in our ears. With how loud it was, it's hard to even guess where it was coming from. So we decided to put out the fire and get in the tent. Later that night, my sister fell asleep, so my brother and I chatted and just made jokes. Within minutes, we heard animals running around outside the tent. And then this little raccoon started to claw at the side of the tent that I was sleeping on. At first, I just kept poking at it. But then we heard something else. The crack of sticks from the trees. At that point, my brother thought it was a bear and told us to be quiet and woke up my sister. We started to hear footsteps coming closer and closer. And pretty quickly, they were right next to me. Now the raccoon just bolted the hell out of there. And then there was this strange odor coming from somewhere. And it smelled like copper, sulfur, and a wet dog. It was almost overpowering and made me feel like I could throw up. Then we heard our mom calling us. And as she shined the flashlight on us, it revealed the most unsettling thing I've ever seen. The shadow of this thing was shining through our tent and it was massive. It had pointed ears that were tilted back like a dog on the prowl and its hands were human looking with long fingers that ended in a point. The mouth was in the shape of a snout just a little shorter and it had a mid-sized tail. My mom started screaming. <laughs> And whatever the thing was, bolted back into the woods, and that's when I got a fairly good look at it. We tore ass inside the house with our mom and didn't go back out for a few days. Now fast forward a few months. I was in the living room with my mom while my sister was in the shower. We were watching Wheel of Fortune or some game show like that 
when my sister screamed, bloody murder. My mom jumped up and went to get her. She pulled her out of the bathroom and I got curious as to why she was freaking out, so I went in to see. Above the shower is one of those super small windows that only a small head could fit through. And in the window was a set of red glowing eyes staring down at me. Holy shit. We stared at each other for what seemed like a decade, even though it could only have been a few seconds. Now here's the weird thing. I didn't feel fear, but more like curiosity. And I didn't feel like I was in any danger at that time. And as my mom came in to get me out, the eyes turned away as well. Now that night was a kind of gloomy night. It wasn't very windy, but there was a light drizzle. Later during the night, my brother and I got woken up to the window being opened. It was locked beforehand, by the way. After that, we just closed it and went back to bed. It happened again and again, like three more times, and each time we locked it. But the final time was the worst. It flung open so hard that the glass shattered, and then we saw the thing that pushed it open. It was that same monstrous hand from the tent, but I could see it clearly now. It had matted black fur, or hair rather, covering its whole arm. The skin on its palms was like a light tan, and the claws were easily five to six inches long. And on the bottom of the window, I saw its face, or what was showing of it. It was just the eyes glowing bright red again, looking like the embers of a roaring fire. My brother and I bolted up, grabbed my sister, and locked ourselves in the back gaming room. We stayed there for the rest of the night. That's when my mom came home. We told her and packed our things. We moved out of that house in a day and took what we could fit, filling one car and a U-Haul trailer. My stepdad's truck was full as well, and we left never to return. To this day, my family is scared to talk about it, but if my brother and I have a few drinks, we discuss it. But my mom, she just shuts down whenever it's brought up. Here's to good friends, tonight is kind of special, the beer will pour, must say something more somehow, so tonight, tonight, tonight let it be low and brown, let it be low and brown, it's been so long, hey I'm glad to see you, raise your glass, here's to health and happiness. So tonight, tonight, let it be all the best. When you're with good friends having good times, don't just have a beer. Have a low and brown. Because good friends and good times deserve the taste of a great beer. And there's really only one, low and brown. Tonight, let it be low and brown. I work in real estate, or more exactly commercial real estate. So my work takes me all over the place from urban industrial areas to very off the beaten path secluded areas, farmlands, development lands, etc. Well on this particular day, which was in October of 2012, my last assignment of the day was to go out and survey an old farmstead near Cayuga in Haldeman County, which is about 30 miles south of Hamilton, Ontario. The place had been vacant since the 90s, and I arrived in the late afternoon, I'd say around 5.30. The place was the last one on a dead-end country road and couldn't be seen from the road. I went up the long driveway and proceeded to do my look over of the place. Now there were three structures, the house, a garage, and a large tool shed. I walked around to the front of the house, which was completely boarded up with no means of seeing inside. I proceeded around the far side toward the other buildings. Now the shed was basically fallen completely down, but the garage was mostly still completely up. 
I noticed around the side door a lot of huge scratches and the door was like half broken down but still held shut by a padlock on one side and the middle and upper hinge. The bottom part was forced inward and the door and clapboards around it were covered with these scratches too. But these didn't seem like the scratches a dog would leave. These scratches were huge and parallel but spread apart almost like fingernail scratches and very deep, obviously put there with a lot of pressure. That's when I looked down and saw huge paw prints, but not regular round paw prints, almost elongated a little bit. Now, the area around this partially broken down door was covered with these paw prints as well. If I had to venture to guess how wide they were, I would say at least five inches. I was wearing dress boots, and when I put my foot over the paw print, I could see the print on either side of my foot, and I wear a size 11, so I don't have tiny feet by any means. Now I began to feel very uneasy, and that's when I recall noticing that all the sounds of the forest were gone. It was dead silent. And that's when I took to noticing a stench, like wet dog, urine, and even shit. I mean, the whole area just smelled rotten like a swamp, rot and decay. But this smell was very strong and very, very putrid. Now that feeling I told you about, that feeling of being uneasy, it only intensified. And all of a sudden, I felt like I wasn't alone and decided I'd seen enough and quickly headed back to my car. That's when I heard something in the bushes and it sounded big. I mean, it was going through the trees very quickly and very hard. So I got back to my car, got my ass in, and locked all the goddamn doors. When I started the car and turned the lights on, that's when I caught eye shine in the tree line ahead of me. Now my first thought was, it might be a dog, or maybe even a fox. But the eye shine was not at the level that a dog's head would be. In fact, it was a hell of a lot higher. I would say four to five feet up, maybe even a bit higher. And although it was getting on toward dusk and there were a lot of shadows, I caught sight of a large wolf looking creature stepping out of the brush. I mean, this damn thing was so big that I knew that it couldn't be any kind of normal animal. But what made me freak all the way the fuck out was when it stood up on two legs. Three words popped into my head time to go. So I quickly backed the car around right into a goddamn wet marshy spot and got my car stuck. Holy shit. I'm out here in the fucking middle of nowhere. Car stuck in the marsh and a damn monster wolf lurking around in the area. But what's crazy too, I was still interested in watching this thing rather than where I was going, which of course was a mistake. So I got my attention quickly back to the car, and as I tried to free myself from the mud, I looked back to where the creature was, and it was gone. At the spot it had been, I could see further into the trees and thought maybe the creature had retreated back into the wood line. After several seconds of rocking my car back and forth, I managed to get out, and I left quickly. I don't think I've ever been so scared in my life. The creature seemed to almost radiate an intense sense of evil. I returned to that spot about a year and a half later and the place is gone. Someone bought the property and tore it down and cut down a lot of the trees. But to the best of my knowledge, nothing's been developed there. It's still just vacant land. For a long time, I didn't even speak about this and I didn't want to be ridiculed or made fun of. A co-worker said it was probably a bear I saw, but I know for a fact that there are no bears this far south in Ontario unless it's in a zoo. I'd long forgotten about this till I recently heard some dogman stories on Blackwater Media and decided to reach out to Dr. Lester about what happened to me. I handled the sale of some farmland on the nearby Six Nations Indian Reservation, and the client was one of the few remaining pure-blood Indians. I'd put him easily in his 80s, if not older. I asked him about odd happenings in the area, like strange animals. And without really telling him about what happened to me, I sort of let him know that I'd had a weird experience, not in detail, 
just that I was on the property when something strange happened. He responded with a question I didn't expect. You saw it, didn't you? He went on to say that there are many things that are unknown to this world, but wouldn't comment further. He only said that there's a good reason that particular place sat empty and unused for decades. I had nightmares about that day for about a year afterwards, and I'm still very hesitant to do surveys in areas like that, because I have no desire to ever again be stalked by Dogman.